Hello and welcome to the High Potential Startups interview series. I'm your host, Nick Taylor, and this podcast is sponsored by Octopus Ventures, one of Europe's largest and most active VCs, with over a billion pounds under management and a portfolio of more than 100 companies. Their investment team specialise in five areas, health, fintech, deep tech, consumer and business to business software. The health team in particular is looking to back entrepreneurs who are transforming the health industry with digital therapeutics through to biotech at seed series A and B. To date, Octopus Ventures have backed some of the most disruptive startups in health, including LV, Big Health, Overture, Ori Biotech and Quit Genius, making them the perfect partners for the podcast as we talk to CEOs at the cutting edge of the life science space, discussing their careers, the highs and lows, as well as taking a much closer look at the future plans for the businesses they are leading. This week, I'm joined by Emil Pott, CEO of Alero Therapeutics, a biotech startup pursuing immunotherapies of food-induced immune disorders with a potential platform to go beyond. The team's experienced as a strong immunotherapy background within the organisation and a really well-established scientific advisory board. The company is on a really interesting journey to target food allergies, which now impact 10% of the population. And with what they're doing and the way they're operating, they've got a really interesting journey ahead of them. I spend a mixture of talking to Emil about Alero, but also himself, who's got a diverse background coming through a legal and IP point of view in business development before entering into a core biotech R&D phase. Hi, Emil. Thanks for joining me on the podcast series. Uh, great to have you here. Really interested to hear about your organization and also your, your journey. Thanks for coming along. Um, for the audience, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Hi, Nick. So, yeah, thanks for um, inviting me. It's really a pleasure and I'm talking to you and uh, being a part of this uh, podcast series. So, great. Um, yeah, so my name is Emil Pott. I'm, um, I'm the CEO of uh, Alero Therapeutics, which is a startup. Um, um, that was established in the uh, end of 2016 in, uh, in Belgium, where I spent most of my, uh, my career. So I started um, in the last century in uh, 1998 at the uh, Vlaanders Institute for Biotechnology, where I was the, um, the first um, licensing manager, business development manager, and um, being involved in, in, in set, setting up um, yeah, several startup companies, um, um, yeah, and some of them uh, might be familiar to you, like uh, like crop design in the agro space and uh, Ablings in the uh, in the nanobody space. At that time, uh, when we started, it was still camelid antibodies, but we changed that into a more general name, which uh, didn't refer to these uh, to these beautiful animals. Um, and one of the startup companies that I um, that I was involved in uh, out of VIP uh, called Actogenics um, was uh, that started in 2006. Um, I joined as a, a co-founder and um, business developer, um, but also as an IP attorney because um, I'm, uh, I'm a registered European patent attorney. Um, and that was a company that we yeah where I sort of learned the most in the nine years that I uh, was uh, working within the company. So we, um, we experienced some uh, highs and lows. Um, so it was a bumpy road, but, uh, but there from a bumpy road, you learn the most. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2015, we managed to, um, to, to you know, sell the company to a, a US company. And that was the start of, of doing something else. And, um, and, and through some, some, um, a lot of discussions with people that I uh, already, um, uh, yeah, know for for quite some time, a twenty year plus, I would say. We um, and are always at the other at the, at the other side of the table um, resulted finally then in uh, coming together at uh, at Alero. So I'm uh, very curious, uh, yeah, to um, yeah, or interested to um, to tell more about that. Okay, that brilliant. A very exciting time. Okay, so what winds me back to European patent attorney, studying law, getting your qualifications there and taking the leap into 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 the biotech life sciences world. Was there a 
is there is there a science background or was it just naturally you sort of fallen into into the space and the ecosystem how, how have you come about having life sciences and as the center point for your career yeah no indeed yeah that yeah that's that's a, a a strange move in my career because yeah indeed I've, I've studied law so normally you end up in a law firm mm -hmm. um but actually I, I always had an interest in in science and that was also in my yeah, my school i had a lot of uh, you know, my my courses were like math, uh, physics, etc. But I didn't know what what I wanted to do. So I thought, okay, let's do law. Then you can, uh, yeah, you can become anything. Um, um, but yeah, right after actually I I, I finished um, law school, then yeah, I did some interns in uh, in patent or in in law firms. But the University of uh, Groningen, um, which is in the northern part of the Netherlands, um, came to me and said, well, you know, we have these beautiful inventions uh, that are lying on the shelf and, um, and, and they need to be patented. And you are a lawyer. So, um, yeah, you know everything about patent law and about you know, com commercializing these, these uh, inventions. Well, normally that's that's not something uh, that you do as as a as as a lawyer uh, to really yeah, commercialize inventions, but actually that triggered again my um, my interest uh, for the science, and yeah, then I was off. So I was yeah I I I never looked at the um, at a career in in a law in a law firm again, and and just focused on uh, yeah on science and. Um, and yeah, and that's that's what I did in in my uh, three years after um, and graduating um, or, or finishing law school. I, um, I I worked in the in the Groningen um, uh, yeah, TTO office, yeah. but then I learned okay in the Netherlands the TTO landscape is not that um, not that great and advanced. And and then the Vlaanderen Institute for Biotechnology um, was started, and I. Um, and uh, yeah, I was immediately interested in that model and thought, okay, this is the way how you should approach that uh, okay. technology transfer. Yeah, looking and you've probably seen a big shift in in the landscape because I think the, Euro the European market, from a TTO perspective, is starting to change. At least in in the journey of my career, I've started to see a shift in terms of the investment that sits behind it, the accelerators that sit behind the universities. This Europe is full of great ideas and we're not particularly great at taking them from concept through to even beginning a business or taking it through to commercializing to a product. Have you seen a big shift in the in the career that you've had on TTOs, how they operate when you started versus how they operate now? Or actually is are we still plagued by many of the same issues that are holding technologies back from going forward? um yeah i do i do see a change but i think it differs from country to country um i think in that respect um uh, vlanders so the dutch speaking part of belgium is doing very well so they have a clear focus on um yeah on microelectronics with imac um on um uh, on, on biotechnology with vib and 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 the government is also willing to put a budget to it yeah so, and I think it um, it all comes down to having a budget available to doing TTO work, uh, and um, and and also being able to to use that budget for a bit more of technology development. And so, not only for finding patents or uh, hiring good uh, business developers, you also should have some tools um, to. You know, to to do a bit of, of product development, to yeah. you know, to de-risk things, and I think that that last part is is um, is getting more and more attention, uh, also from the different countries, and also driven, I think, out of Europe as well, where we see is that innovation will be yeah uh, key for us to to really you know create uh, further economic growth in the region. Not being dependent on you know these huge countries like and the U.S. and I also starting China to um, you know to do to do innovative developments. Yeah. Okay. So um, do you think it's that 
maybe to to put a tag on it that incubator mentality that that desire to take it further than a pattern that makes the difference between countries that are doing it well and countries that are not those that can put that take it that much further just to de-risk it enough for investment is that um do you think those those in europe that are doing well those in europe that are not doing so well is is likely around that that transition point that sort of six to twelve month window post pattern i I I I think that yeah that really makes a difference yeah. yeah if you you know it's you know having a patent is you know is is in that sense not making a huge difference you 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 also should add you know a product development or de risking to it um, because most of the time or if if not yeah, or all the time um, you know these these yeah, beautiful findings from the university. They are, you know, still rough diamonds and mm -hmm. um, and and not polished enough for for industry to yeah to being absorbed. And so they they most of the time they need more um, um, more data, more uh, more de-risking before taking it up, and um, and that's the same for uh, for creating uh, new companies. So VCs also want to see a bit more than only you know a target, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and that's what you see all the time. So the the really er, taking early risk, that's that is that is a difficult part uh, for for industry and for VCs. Um, more here in Europe, I would say, than in the US, where there's maybe a bit of a different mentality, but also there uh, you you see that typical uh, development gap which needs to be bridged uh, before yeah being able to be absorbed. Uh, okay. Okay, and um, and so you you I guess you you've been involved in these different TTOs and you've seen the good, probably some of the bad and the ugly. Um, I imagine it's similar when you when you're looking at the companies that you're spinning out and you're attempting to commercialize that there've been some phenomenal teams and others that really just haven't had the dynamic to get moving. What do you think the you know the the size always play, plays a part? You know, I'm I'm of the opinion and belief that good businesses, particularly in life sciences, are built up of three parts. The the technology, the science that sits behind it, the money, and then the people. When you're looking at the the patents or the products or the, the ideas to take forward in a within a TTO, who what what sort of metrics do you look at? You know, I think it's quite common that we talk about VCs and, and the metrics that they look at, the quantifiable pieces that make it an attractive investment. But for for yourself, where it's very early stage and you've got to take massive risk on taking something forward, do you do you spend much time assessing anything but the science? What do you look at as the the pieces that you the markers that you look for to say, right, yeah, let's bring this in, let's put more money into it, let's really drive this forward? What are the pieces that are important to you? Yeah, I think what what are if you if you look at the science, if you look at the innovation, um, you, you want to have something which really um, and create something novel uh, um, and also which addresses a a, a medical need. Uh, um, and that can be because there is there is no uh, um, uh, treatment uh, for a particular disease, or that there is um, that that there is a lot to improve uh, because there are, uh, the existing um, uh, treatments have a lot of side effects, for instance, or bad quality of life, um, or very little uh, efficiency. Um, so, so you know, that that if that could be improved, that that is also very important. Um, so that's what I look at at the science part, so at the you know, the technology part, and the other thing which is important when you yeah, um, think of company creation is that you also have the right people to take it forward, yeah, because um, a, a greatest ideas um, can be can be killed in no time by uh, by people who have no experience uh, whatsoever. And um, but but that's also a bit vice versa. I think um, uh, semi world ideas can be and taken to a great flourishing by by a good team. Yeah. Um, um, of course, that doesn't count for bad ideas because that's that's uh, nobody can do something with it. But um, I would say that, yeah, that a team, a good team is is very important. And um, and in particular a team that has experience. Um, and and yeah, and even bad experience count um, because that's that's what I've seen is that um, 
is that I've learned the most of, of the things that went wrong. Um, and in particular in my, my previous company, uh, Actogenics. Okay. Okay. And is that, um, with the Larry Therapeutics now and the, the team that you're trying to build, how, you know, the people that you've got around you, do you, do you spend a lot of time assessing sort of mindset, thinking about culture fit, thinking about values, or is it very heavily, actually, maybe, maybe to that point, do you know a lot of the people that have joined you on the journey? Are they people that you've known from the past that you've been able to plug in? How, how have you gone about building, building your team environment? Um, yeah, so with, with the team of Valero, and, and then I'm talking about the four founders, um, yeah, we, we know each other already for really 20 years plus, but always on the other side of the table. Um, so when I'm talking about uh, Paul Sorensen or uh, CSO, um, I've known him for, for more than 20 years when he was at the different uh, pharma biotech companies and where I was trying to, you know, to do deals with him um, out of, out of Actogenics and, and also out of VIB. Um, and, and so we, yeah, we developed a friendship and also, you know, uh, could talk about, about the signs, about possibilities, opportunities. Um, and, and the same with, with Gaze Lenaut, so our uh, COO, CTO, who I've known from my time in, uh, in Groningen, um, where he actually also founded a company. Um, and, um, and, and, and the same for Federico Grego, who is, um, who is our CFO and uh, was co-CEO of the, uh, of the Letty Pharma um, uh, family, which is a mid-sized allergy company in, uh, in Europe. So we, I think we all have, you know, um, a same mindset. Um, we've been through, um, yeah, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, highs and lows. Yeah. Um, we've, um, we, we know what it takes, you know, to bring a product to the clinic um, we know that sometimes shortcuts are not desired, um, but we also know, you know, what are the right things to do? What do you need to collect uh, in terms of data, uh, de-risking, um, and, uh, yeah, and I think that, that, that helps. And, and actually we started, um, out of a discussion, um, that was related to, okay, you know, you have this immunotherapy yeah, and allergy and also uh, 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 maybe a bit, you know, in autoimmune diseases, but, you know, there is, there is such a problem with the bioavailability. So, and that's how we, you know, started to think. Yeah? So first me and Paul um, about, yeah, okay, you should improve that. Um, and so the sublingual immunotherapy, we should improve that. And at, at the time with aptogenics, we, we try to address it with, you know, with a genetically engineered bacteria that you deliver in, in, in the intestine. Okay, that has also a lot of challenges. Um, so how can you overcome that? And then we thought, oh, we should do it, you know, orally. Yeah, so actually it was, it was you know, innovation at the, at the kitchen table. So yeah. Forth. And, and then we said, oh, yeah, but then you need to have, you know, these, these live bacteria. We should, we should, you know, get rid of it. We should make it inert, but keep the same properties. And then we thought, of, oh, yeah, we need to go to Case. And we, we, we called Case and we said, we have a wonderful idea. We think that your, you know, your, your bacteria-like particles are, are great for um, uh, tolerizing and, and instead of what he was doing, actually, vaccination, so vice versa. And to our surprise, he said, I know. And that's what I already <laughs> <laughs> proposed to my board, but they, yeah, they don't want to put money in it. And they were doing actually clinical trials with a vaccination, but within three months they had the results and it was like we, like we mentioned. And then he said, okay, now I can join you guys because I think this is really a great idea. So that's how it, that, that's actually yeah. how it started. And then we took uh, Federico with it because he, he, he knows the market in the allergy space um, very well. Um, so that, that, that was how the team was born, actually. Um, okay, great. Okay, so you've got this, uh, you've got a really solid multidisciplinary team that's, that's formed the foundation for this organization, which is, which is phenomenal, right? And, um, do you know, the, I think the joy of knowing people for a long amount of time, having that, that history and embedded history of people is not only that, you know, you, you get up, you get up and you're happy to deal with the person Monday to Friday, but also when 
you disagree, often you can have that conversation. You know, it's not it's not sensitive. People don't look at it as you, you're digging at the personality. It's more just a case of, you know, I disagree with you. Let's have a conversation. And uh, I was speaking to someone recently about harmony being a problem within a business. It's actually an issue in my mind. You know, if there isn't clash, if there isn't challenge on opinions and thought processes, well, you tend not to go through those steps that you talked about where someone goes, actually, look, that's a great idea, but what about this, this and this? You've forgotten about that. Let's, we've got to do something better. We've got to go one step further to get where we want to get to. So um, those long term relationships, having that, those bonds that are harder to break um, when you do have moments of challenge and you will, because that's that's biotech, right? Um, yeah. It's not meant to be a smooth, straight line. Uh, if it was, it'd be easy and anyone would do it. So um good um okay so so you so you're now in the business for a couple of years the organization is starting to to take real shape in terms of its journey and perhaps a build off the back of it and and fundraising and everything else that goes into an organization like this um what do you see for, for people that are listening and, and considering their options maybe from a from a job perspective considering their career what do you see as the future of the company from a from a culture and internal mentality, how would you like to build out the business when people, you know, when you're 50 people, when you're 100 people, when you're 200 people down the line? What are you hoping people say about the internals of the company? Um, yeah, I, I, I hope they will. When, when, when we were successful and when we sold the company, is then when they're looking back, is then I hope they will say, um, you know, it was, was really fun working in the company. It was always, you know, it was content driven, but there was also a lot of joy. And, and, and actually, you know, it, it wasn't really work. It was, you know, it didn't feel like working. Yeah. Because, you know, we enjoyed it. And, and, and yeah, and I hope that they also don't feel it like there was, you know, stress. It can be busy. It's and it will be busy because there's a lot of work and you need to work hard. But um, without stress, you know, uh, without that kind of negative things, so I, ho I hope that they will experience it like that, and that we, you know, and that and that we can still come together and be and be friends, and that there's no and that there, you will, that yeah, the friendship maintains. So you that that is what I hope. Here afterwards, right? Um, okay. Um, for a bit of a personal question then on the on the note of stress and well being and it's important to to look after yourself. Do you um, you know, do you, do you spend a lot of time on your own well being? Is there are there things and influences on you that you know you've got the challenge of being CEO? It's an isolated job. It can be really tricky. What do you do to to look after yourself and and keep your your head stress free and focused on the right things and and almost converting that pressure pressure into good behaviors instead of bad behaviors which i think is often you know the difference between stress and um high performance is often how, how do you deal with it how do you cope with it um when you've got pressure on you yeah okay that that's um that's that's a good question so physically what i do is i, I um i make sure is that i i i'm in good shape so what i do is i i do a triathlon um um uh, training so I and during the week I um, I swim I um, I you know run and I bike so to nice. make sure is that that you know that the um, that I'm physically in good shape because that's I think very important um, and then what I yeah what I try to do is is uh, and having no stress is um, trying to um, reserve as much time as possible to prepare for things okay. um, prepare for uh, meetings um, uh, things uh, strategic thinking um, just then sitting uh, uh, taking some time to think about that and and not rushing uh, things so I think that that already helps a lot um, also, what helps for me is is uh, talking a lot uh, to to the people within the company, and, uh, and 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 trying to get on on the same um, on the same wavelength. Um, 
not only within and the company, the team itself, but also with the investors. Um, and and actually, yeah, making sure is that the whole herd is is you know on the same line and on the same and 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 want to go to the same direction. Uh, so that's yeah, a bit the way I I I, I do it and and. And of course, uh, um, and content driven and strategically driven, I also uh, would like to pinpoint the direction, but it's it's not always the exact direction that that um, and that on beforehand that you have in your mind that that is resulting uh, in the final direction after you've talked to all the people, etc. So, but but that's okay, you know. It's um, once uh, if if the direction and the the resulting direction is okay and leads to success, uh, of which I'm convinced uh, because I need to be convinced because otherwise, yeah, we uh, again we need to turn direction. But um, you know, if if the if the joint direction has success, then um, I'm happy, and yeah. you know, I think that that results then in in yeah, in less stress. Oh yeah, um, and that that natural desire to listen to people. I think it's a phenomenal skill in a CEO because a good for me a good CEO listens to those around, takes it in, absorbs it all, and goes right. Here's the right course to to take, and um, that balance between designing a strategy but doing it based on gathering the intelligence that you've got. You know the reason you build a, a team of brilliant talent around you is so that you've got the opinions to listen to at the right point in time to build the right strategy and then begin to execute that strategy. And if you need to pivot, um, you know biotech you've got your 90 day plan, your 360 day plan, probably a five year strategy and a 10 year strategy. The reality is probably every day you tinker with it and you're, you're veering course slightly as you as you navigate your way towards those checkpoints and those signposts that measure success, whether that be stepping into clinical trials or heading into a phase three or yeah. uh, looking at sort of regulatory strategy posts. Um, yeah, no, indeed. And, and, and you know, I... <laughs> I do have a strong opinion, you know, or about you know corporate strategy, business development strategy, and clinical development. I said I, I do have a strong uh, um, opinion about that, but I'm I'm always you know open for you know for counter arguments where I need to think. Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Maybe that makes sense indeed. Uh, maybe it's it's even better. Um, so, you know. Um, I think it's good to have to show your opinion to, you know, to confront the team with it and, and, you know, people outside of the team, but then get feedback or allow to get feedback um, in order to, you know, to improve that, to improve the, you know, the direction, the strategy. Okay. I think, I think that's important. Okay, good. And um, so you've made this, made this journey into, into life sciences and you've now been in the industry for sort of 30 odd years. Is there what's what's the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning and gets you sat back down at your laptop and and going again? What's the what's the driver for you? Yeah, I, I would say that the driver is is at the end is it's the patience. Okay. Because I, you know, I've, I've I've seen through the years some really wonderful science and um and things where I think okay if these can result in something in in a treatment for the patient that would really be great you know and um and i've seen and recently very recently even and some stuff in the oncology space and because i'm i'm also uh, doing some work for oncode institute which is a cancer related institute in the netherlands i've seen things which are really quite simple but could improve the the uh, survival rate of um of patient of, of a subset of patients um with with 60 percent well you know that is amazing huh? um but also in the you know in in the field that we are working in um allergy and autoimmune diseases if we can you know cure type 1 diabetes and i've seen some really great results from where we also would like uh, are, are what we also are embarking on that um yeah that could cure really type 1 diabetes you know to readdress the immune system to reset it and really you know have the have the body 
uh, and the immune system uh, accept you know, these these autoantigens. You know that would really be great. Then that is what um, gets me out of bed, and that is what makes me the most happy. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so for people listening that don't know Alara Therapeutics, what's the what's the mission and vision for the business? Yeah, well, the, the, the mission is, is, is really to, um, to cure, um, cure diseases. And in, and in this case, in the, in the allergy and autoimmune spaces is to, um, to reset the immune system um, and making sure is that this unwanted immune response, you know, an allergy and an autoimmune disease does not happen anymore. Okay. That, okay. Is, that is our focus. That is our mission uh in life okay and there's um in terms of your initial focus the sort of particularly food induced immune disorders i think in terms of and i guess looking at it from a personal perspective so um one of my daughters has a has a dairy allergy which so she's only she's three in july the reality for her and even over her journey and from when she was born from where she is now i think the world is really coming to be aware of allergies. You know, I think traditionally a peanut allergy across the board, people were very aware of, um, you know, the notes that go, go back, I think back to when I was a child and, you know, you couldn't bring peanut based goods into school, pieces like that. Uh, I think the world has come a long way in 20, 30, 40 years in terms of how we view allergies, particularly over the last five years. Um, celiac disorder has taken a big a big step forward people being aware of it people being tested for it um people actually being acutely aware of how their body works and starting to become i think far more personalized in how we approach pieces like food induced immune disorders where there are real challenges and um i think we're adapting or the environment is starting to adapt very well but the problem is only getting bigger um, am I right in saying that? And that's that. A lot of those are just my, my thoughts. Well, that's that's indeed what we see. Yeah, is that yeah. that the um, that the percentage of of uh, of people suffering from a food allergy, from an allergy in general, is is really uh, taking off uh, and, and to great numbers. So, already ten percent of the of the people do have um, do have a food allergy, and I think that's even underdiagnosed. And we will see in the next uh, decades that that will that will increase uh, tremendously. So so there we really need to do something. Um, and there are certain allergies, and you mentioned one peanut allergy, which 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 can be very severe, and um, which takes away and the quality of life of, um, of of a lot of patients, but but also from parents. You. Know, you you said it yourself, huh? um, so you're you're very worried as a parent. As a parent, and now your child is, is still s small, huh? so you you have an eye on her every day. So you know what she takes in uh, or yeah. not. Yeah. But um, but but when when you you know when she goes off huh, to a party, um, oh yeah, and, and, birthday and, parties are a, a milk minefield. Well, um. ex exactly, <laughs> and and that's and that's where you start worrying, you know. Um, and you can't be there with them all the time, eh? and, and at least not when they're teenagers. So that's, you know, um, and the worry of parents um, should not be underestimated. So this, this is, this, this is what we've taken then as, as you know, as a, as a focus of the company. Although um, the technology is much, much broader than that. So it's, it, it, it covers the whole field of allergy, so not only food allergy, but also indoor outdoor allergies uh, okay. um, and also autoimmune diseases um, and celiac disease, by the way, is, is considered as an autoimmune disease. And that's why we've taken that as a first um, first indication to be, you know, to to be um, to be at the doorstep of, of the autoimmune space, but really still, you know, keeping the focus of um, of. of yeah, of food allergies or food related immune disorders. Um, yeah, just as a company to get a focus, although it's even broader than the two spaces that I already mentioned. It's it's it also relates actually to all the ADA and gene therapy um, uh, treatments, because that's also what we can deliver. You know, we can we can um, learn the body to tolerate these these antibody uh, treatments, but also the uh, the gene therapy treatments. So um, 
understand that the reply and the immune response on the capsid um, uh, yeah. proteins yeah, on on the viral vectors. So, and these are you know, the problems that, that a lot of companies, antibody companies and, and gene therapy companies suffer from is that, you know, they're giving these to their patients, but they see um, uh, neutralizing antibodies developing at a certain point in time. And then, you know, the therapy is worthless. So here uh, um, we can also address, you know, an issue which which is re which has a very big medical need and um, and and. At the moment, and we, you know, consider that as a business development field. So we're doing only partnerships um, and related to specific targets that they're working on. But that's, you know, it's it's the space is very broad. But we we try to to focus then only on the food allergy space. Um, sure. Okay, so that's the the initial focus for the business. And so you've got a great team. You've got some some really solid scientific advisors um, in the backboard of the backbone of the business. And just to just to touch on the size and scale of the issue, because you mentioned there's sort of ten percent of the population have a essentially a life threatening or a, at least a, an allergy based a food allergy that would would impact them seven days a week. You get up in the morning and you've got to be conscious and careful of operating and behaving in a certain way for for risk of a. a I think any any form of anaphylactic shock or any form of anaphylactic reaction. Um, when you look at celiac disease, how broad does that cover? What's the reality of the the scale of the issue for across the world, across Europe, US um, for celiac? Yeah, so so the prevalence at the moment of, of celiac disease is uh, 3.5 million in the US, 5 million in Europe, and and about more, yeah, uh, around 15 million people affected um, yeah, in, in the rest of the world. So we're, we're really talking about big numbers here. So um, uh, 20, 25 million people that are suffering from, uh, from celiac disease. With, with celiac disease, it's, 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 it's an autoimmune disease. Um, you don't see that typical anaphylactic shock, uh, which you see with, with, with typical food allergies uh, um, or, or when you have been um, been, been hit by uh, you know by a wasp or something, so yeah. you don't you don't see that anaphylactic shock, um, and 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 um, and and that's also one of the reasons uh, why um, it's it's even safe you know to to really challenge uh, celiac disease patients with minute minute amounts of of uh, gluten uh, where they're uh, um, allergic to uh, where they have an immune response to so and that's also what we use in our in our you know in our innovative product so in our patch uh, the patch that we that we've developed uh to be applied uh, in the in the buccal space okay um so and, and um with celiac disease you mentioned it doesn't have the the sort of maybe atypical anaphylactic pieces that come off the back of it but there are so the reason this is a, a big issue am i right in saying that yeah, this is just from experience with friends that I know. There's really no solution other than avoid gluten wherever possible. And I say wherever possible because it's almost near impossible to avoid because it's been pretty much any, yeah. any product you look at. Um, yeah. Is are there any treatments out there? Are there any, any options for, for anyone besides strict diet management? For celiac disease, there's there's no option at the moment. So that's only a gluten free diet. Yeah. OK. Um, and and then in terms of the impact on people's lives, of course, the the day to day, but the reality of them ingesting gluten, significant potential triggers off the back of that. Is that right? So, you know, if they're, if if someone was eating a, a croissant a day, they're going to have potential issues like neurological disorders, potential cancer, infertility. The, the sort of scale of the issue for someone that suffers from this is pretty long lasting and damaging. If, um, to attempt to try and leave it, lead a very normal life. Yeah, no, no, indeed, and 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 that is actually what we try to um, to restore, and um, and this is and so we have a um, at the moment a whole preclinical program, um, tox program, and also clinical program ready, um, which we which we have presented to the uh, Swedish medical authorities for scientific advice. And, um, and and actually which they um, uh, 
last last month uh, approved. So they agreed with with Ray how we would like to um, to develop into the clinic, and and that basically says is that we're going to uh, for uh, for nine weeks we're going to um, to apply one patch um, okay. uh, per per week to these uh, to these patients. And um, and after nine weeks, these patients uh, should see an effect. And so that's that's what we um, uh, have as 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 one of our clinical endpoints. Um, obviously, because it's the first in in man, first in in patient. We our primary endpoints are um, and safety, obviously, um, but we're also in in um, in other endpoints, exploratory endpoints, looking at efficacy as well, and. And that's what we see as our uh, target product profile is that we, uh, during a period of nine uh, weeks, were um, treating these patients um, with a patch every every week, and then um, we need to see we should see that there is a an induction of immune tolerance towards gluten. Um, what we do expect, though, okay. um, and that's the nature of the patients, um, uh, more being, being prone towards you know, loss of tolerance, is that every year we um, we will need to um, and to do a um, uh, a retreatment of 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 one or two patches uh, per year. Okay. Okay. Um, so. So the product that they're receiving, so a patient patient comes into hospital or comes into to a treatment centre. Um, I presume this is being administered within a hospital as it stands, but long term this would be something that someone potentially does at home, gets picked up the prescription, takes home. It's, it's typically yeah a home based product. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. So mouth patch, uh, and is it a device or is it is it a drug? What's the what's the route and path for the business? No, this 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 is a uh, this this should be seen as a as a drug. Um, okay. So it's it's regulated through the um, uh, through the EMA uh, in Europe and through the medical agencies in uh, in the different countries, also FDA. So no, this is seen as a um, it, it should be seen as a formulation, a formulation of uh, what we have in our drug, which is the and bacterial like particles for inducing uh, tolerance. And the uh, particular antigen. Um, uh, so in this case, it's 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 a gluten. It's gliadin, uh, a gluten uh, antigen, and okay. so it's just a formulation. It's it's not um, it's not a medical device. Okay. And what are the advantages of using those non-living bacterial particles? Because you can uh, standardize them very easily. Um, you you also know exactly you know what you put in. Um, and um, and and also what is being delivered. So there is you you, you can um, easily establish the dose uh, and and also the ratio with the uh, with the antigens that you are that you're formulating. Okay. Was there any reason? So the patch I think you mentioned the patch is designed to to be put into your mouth. Is there any reason you can you're not considering a sort of like nicotine patch equivalent and putting it on your shoulder or um, sort of directly in ingesting it, which is maybe not a good idea with the patch itself. Um, what what are the what are the options and what's what's the reason that um, you've gone down the route that you have? Yeah, no, that that's a good question because there there are there are companies who um, who have a patch which is you know put on the skin and and in that way they are you know, they want to deliver um, antigens, but actually the skin is is more prone towards you know defense, um, and um, so that would easily lead to the opposite uh, reaction, um, which is being you know a um, um, yeah some kind of a vaccination approach, uh, so to rather combat the antigen. Uh, then, then tolerize them. Whereas the the mucosal layer, so the intestinal mucosal, which the oral mucosal layer is part of it, is is actually um, um, a privileged immune tolerance environment. So it sees you know, like the intestine, you know, it it sees um, foreign antigens, you know, throughout the day, and and so they've learned is that they should create a tolerizing environment. So that's what you that that's what we've used, yeah. um, 
And in this case, we've used the oral mucosal layer because it's it's easy to um, to reach huh? and um, much easier than the intestinal layer where you know you have lots of meters of, of you know of bowel or where you need to compete even with um, two kilograms of, of other bacteria um, and and so we rather you know used um, and thought of uh, using the or mucosal layer as an entry point for for draining to the lymph nodes and and creating a systemic effect and a systemic in, induction of tolerance towards you know the antigens that you are that you are delivering, so that's why we we also call it it's, uh, uh, immune um, uh, uh, antigen specific immune tolerance uh, rather than immune tolerance in general, because we 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 give the the antigen uh, with it, and we've we've shown in in. Um, in, in our experiments that, you know, the um, uh, the regulatory T cells that we create are, are very much antigen specific and not um, and not general. Okay, okay, brilliant. Um, so individual takes the patch and you said, so over the course of the current clinical trial, over the course of nine weeks, an individual takes a patch a week to then induce this long lasting effect. How um, long were you, are you hoping to have a response for how you know, for a patient using it? What's the what's the yeah. idea of having to develop the product to? Yeah, so what we hope is that it will it will at least um, last for one year. Okay. And and then afterwards you need to do these these uh, remit therapies like uh, you know one or two patches um, a year to. And to maintain that um, immune tolerance, yeah. um, and by the way, the patches—if you—if you put them in the mouth, they—they um, they are designed to um, to deliver the and the content within half an hour, maximum an hour, and afterwards they they biodegrade. So yeah. there's also no use to yeah, you don't need to 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 take them off; they will degrade anyway. Okay, so you have it in your mouth; it dissolves and. It is all yeah, we've we've tried it ourselves, you know, you don't you don't <laughs> feel it actually. Um yeah. Okay. Um so it, it gives a really significant amount of time because that's the I think in terms of course of treatment. And if you're doing this all at home, actually from a patient perspective, this is super easy to manage, super super easy to use, very this, straightforward. This is indeed this is super easy to use and, and you know the um the advantage even of this approach is that you that it has also a, a, a pediatric um, mm -hmm. um, application. Yeah? So we've we've also been talking to the Swedish authorities, and and they also acknowledge is that this is this is perfectly suited for for treating really really young kids, um, and and of course you know, you need to um, you, you need to modify the size maybe of the of the patches which are now. Uh, maximum uh, three centimeters by three centimeters. Um, you you can even make them smaller. Um, so so one centimeter by one uh, um, could also be enough. And there, you know, if you see that these small children are are developing uh, typically these food uh, related allergies, but also and type one diabetes, is that you know at the first diagnosis. Um, and that's important. Is the earlier you diagnose, the better it is, and the better it is to start treatment right away after the early diagnosis, you can you can really um, readdress, you know, um, the immune system and also in type 1 diabetes, what we've seen in in these these early onset um, um, type 1 diabetes is that you that you can really rescue these these beta cells um, and and have them, you know, um, uh, differentiate and, and uh, and, and grow again. So, so there you can really make a difference um, by by really being early. Emil's got a really interesting journey ahead, and the company's got the right trajectory to go forward. Looking forward to your thoughts on the podcast. <laughs>